Thank you for watching today. However you are listening to me, if you are watching on YouTube or if you are listening to me, I want to say thank you for including me into your day. This is Bible Study. I am Minister Marcus. Uh, I want to welcome you to the Bible Study Podcast. We do have a class in here. Come on, give yourself a hand. Amen. All right. You may hear them. You may not hear them. Uh, can you go close that back door back there? You may hear them. You may not hear them. As you can see, we are in the sanctuary today. We are having some repairs done in our church. So if you are online, please pray for that. But I'm going to open up with a prayer and then we're going to go right into our lesson. A simple lesson, most likely a quick lesson. Hopefully it'll be a quick lesson. Um, we're coming from the book of Nahum, chapter number one. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to roll right into our lesson. All right. So let's bow our heads. God, I say thank you. Thank you, God, for this opportunity. Thank you, God, for those who are here. Thank you, God, for those who are watching this. I pray, God, that you will let this word um, help us to understand you better. I pray that you will reveal yourself to us through this word. And I pray, God, that you will let this word uh, 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 encourage us, God, and, and lead us in, in walking the way that you would have us to walk. I ask you now, God, that you would feed me the right words, impart wisdom. I ask for revelation, God, that you would speak to me and speak through me to your people. Help me today, God, to articulate my thoughts. And then, God, I pray, God, that you would do a supernatural thing, God. I ask that your Holy Spirit would follow on us tonight, today. And I pray, God, that you would just speak to us those things that we need to hear. Overshadow my shortcomings, God, and bless your people. In Jesus' name, hear my heart and my mind. Hear my spirit. In Jesus' name, Lord, I love you. And amen. Amen. All right. Nahum chapter 1, we are going to skip through some verses. Um, and I'm reading out of the King James Version just because I like it. <laughs> All right. Uh, Nahum, minor prophet, right after the book of Micah, chapter number one. And I'm going to begin at verse number one, and I'll tell you when to skip down. It says, beginning at verse one, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. God is jealous, and the Lord revenge it. The Lord revenge it and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. And he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord had his way in the whirlwind and in the storm mm -hmm. and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuked the sea and make it dry and dry it up all the rivers. But Sean languisheth and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good. Yeah. A stronghold in the day of trouble. He knoweth them that trust in him. Yeah. All right. Now I want you to do this. I want you to skip down to verse number 11. This is what it says. There is one come out of thee. When it says come out of thee, there's one that comes out of thee, Nineveh or Assyria, that imagines evil against the Lord. A wicked counselor. Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. For I will break his yoke from off thee and I will burst thy bonds in sunder. All right. So don't really have a topic or a title for that. I know some of that was like, what is Nahum talking about? And hopefully I can give you some understanding as to what's going on at this particular place in the Bible. I wanted us to read to uh, read verse 15, but if we get there, I'll just read it and we'll go to it. But we may not get there. But I want to start by giving you the history. So where we are, the minor prophets are inserted. So if you are doing your Bible studies, um, you can read through 1 Kings, 2 Kings, or First Chronicles and Second Chronicles. I, I would prefer you to read through First Kings, Second Kings, 
because it gives all the history of the, the, the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah, which was separated. So um, what I want you to see is that the prophets can be inserted into those times. So if you read in the Kings what King was reigning at that time and you find a prophet, sometimes the prophets will give you clues as to where they belong in the story. So that's what I want to point out. I want to point out that Nahum is prophesying around the time that the, the, the northern nation of Israel had been carried off into captivity by the Assyrians. Mm -hmm. So back in those days, this is before civilization. They all moved by tribes. If my army was bigger than yours and stronger than yours, we could overtake y'all. If we disagreed with what you were saying and how you was living, and we wanted your land, we could just come and take it. Yeah. So they did everything by war. At this time in history, Assyria had grown to a state of power. They controlled everything. They were the strongest nation. They were the strongest army. They were the big bad bullies of the world. And I want you to see that. And so God used them to take the northern kingdom of Israel into captivity because of their sins. All right? And I want you to walk with me. He used Assyria to take the northern kingdom. Israel had been split into two kingdoms. One was Judah. One was Israel. Israel had been taken into captivity. Can you close this door? They had been taken into captivity by Assyria. Now, get this, Assyria now turns its attention to the other half of the nation, which is called Judah. And this is where I want to point out. In the book of 2 Kings, in the, the 18th chapter, when you get home, when you get time, read when Hezekiah got sick because the nation of Assyria had turned their attention towards the nation of Judah and the king begins to say to the people who are working on the wall, uh -huh. don't listen to your king. Nobody can stand against me. I'm the strongest king that there has ever been. Yeah. I'm the baddest army that there has ever been made. No God has been able to stand against me. Your God will fall just like all the other nations God has fallen. And I want you to get that. I want you to understand that where we are in the story because yeah. it sets up for Nahum. Now, if you don't understand that, it seems like Nahum is just talking. Now, when it, now the thing that, that brought my attention to that is if you remember, God says to Jonah uh -huh. to go and prophesy to Nineveh. This was years before. So I want you to think uh, Jonah speaks to Nineveh and they repented. Years later, Assyria rises to power. And you know what happened when you get a little power, yeah. buddy, when you get a little strength. You know, the old folks, they say they start smelling yourself, yeah. right? You know, you get, you know, my teenagers, you know, when they get when they get a little bit bigger, when they get a little older, the voice starts to get a little deeper. You know, you start to feel yourself. And so Assyria had gotten so powerful that they started to feel themselves. Now, they start to direct their attention towards Judah, and God don't want them to attack Judah, but because they were feeling themselves, they start to speak. Now, remember, yeah. Hezekiah now gets sick. And he turns his face to the wall. Y'all remember the story? Yeah. And then God says to Hezekiah, he's, uh, and you know, uh, uh, Isaiah comes back, turns to him, and he says, uh, I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver this city. When he said deliver this city, he was talking to delivering them out of the hand of the Assyrians. Yeah. Then he said, I will defend. So at this time, it is believed Nahum prophesies even either during the time of Hezekiah yeah. or during the time of Josiah. And I want to point that out. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria and Assyria had just carried away their brothers and sisters into captivity and they had taken the northern kingdom now they set their sights on the southern kingdom and the king of Assyria has now been been started to throw out these insults to God and this is why I want, this is why I wanted to read that uh, verse number 11 one has come out of the that imagines evil against the Lord the wicked counselor is the king of Assyria right and so he prophesies now get this they who opens the book with personalities yeah, of yeah. God with God's Personality. I would like to say characteristics. And even though he's a minor prophet, I always and I always say this. I want you when you read the Bible to look at the things that they, how people describe God. Yeah. It's God's personality characteristics. 
And the first thing that he says about God is that God is jealous. Yeah. The first thing that he says is that God is jealous, and I and, and I know that took too, a little bit of time to set up, but I want that I want you to have that base of understanding so you can see where we're going with this. When he says that God is jealous, most of the time I get questioned about the jealousy of God because we know jealousy to be wrong. Yeah. We know jealousy to be a sin because when we think of jealousy, we think of jealousy in the sense of being envious. Yeah. yeah. Like I want what this person has, or because this person has it and. I don't have it now. I'm, I feel jealous of him, yeah, but yeah. I don't want you to think of jealous, the jealousy of God this way because God is not envious. But when it says that God is jealous, I want you to see it as a man being jealous over his wife. And twofold. First of all, a man that is jealous over his wife wants his wife to be faithful. Yeah. So when it says that God is jealous, God is saying that God wants faithfulness from those who pledge their allegiance yeah. to him. So on the one hand, God is jealous because he wants your faithfulness to him. Yeah, yeah. Just like a man wants his wife's faithfulness to him. You can't be married to one and sleeping with another yeah. because that goes against your vows. And here's God. You can't pledge your allegiance to me, but then bow down to your call yeah, or yeah. bow down to your lust or bow down to your other things. And so when it says that God is a jealous God, on the one hand, he wants your faithfulness. Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, it's, it's saying that God, just like a man with his wife, he is protective yeah, and yeah, yeah. defensive about the, what belongs to him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So, so when you see that God is jealous, I want you to see it as though God is not jealous in the sense of envy, but in this case, God's jealousy is revealed in the sense of him being protective and defensive of his people. And when he says that God is jealous, what it shows is that God intends to defend his people against the Assyrians. Anytime someone thinks that they are so powerful that they think they can overpower God, they make a mistake. And I want you to get this. God took it personal. And so God decides, I am going to fight for my people. And I want you to get this. If you belong to God, you have to know that God will fight for you. If you don't hear nothing else that Minister Marcus said today, know that God will fight fight for you. When it seems like the enemy is bigger than you, know that God will fight for you. When it seems like the enemy has more power than you, you have to know that God will fight for you. He defines God's personality as being jealous because he wants the nation to understand even though the Assyrians are more powerful, you have a God that will fight for for you. Oh, yeah. I believe sometimes God allows enemies to come against you who are bigger than you, who are stronger than you. Things that seem like you can't win no matter what. You can't fight back. I believe God allows things like that yeah, just yeah. to show you that he's the kind of God that will fight on your behalf. Yeah. And I believe he allows that just so you can see that no matter how big the challenge is or not, no matter how big the opposition is, that God will fight for you and God will win. Yeah, and this yeah. is why when he, what he says is he defines God as jealous and then he says the Lord revenges. And this is why I put the, he put the jealousy first, and I'm glad because it makes it easier for me to make the point, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that God is jealous, and then the Lord revenges. In other words, it's getting you to understand that, that God is protective, God is uh, defensive of his people, yeah, yeah. and at the same time, God will repay the evil that has been done to you. And why do I make that point? I stress that point because I want you to understand when God says vengeance is mine, you have to trust that God That's is right. going That's to right. take vengeance on himself on your behalf. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When it says vengeance is mine, it's, it's the way of saying that God wants you to understand that God will repay the yeah. evil that is done to you. When you can't fight for yourself, God will defend you. And when people do wrong to you, God will take vengeance yeah, on your yeah. enemies. And we have to learn to let God handle it. That's and it. my number one was God would fight for you. My number two would be let God handle it. Yeah, there yeah, are yeah. some things that God would have you to do. There are some battles that God would have you to fight. But there are times that you have to sit back and let God handle it. The hard principle is to learn to let God 
repay the evil done to you and stop trying to take matters into yeah, your yeah. own hands. It is God's place to recompense the evil, not yours. And I want to stress that because sometimes when people do you wrong, you want to retaliate. Yeah, you want to yeah, get yeah. your revenge. But here it's saying that God gets his revenge. Everything, let me say this, everything is not for you to retaliate or get your or get stuck in your feelings of the moment when it happens. Sometimes you gotta learn how to trust God and let God handle it. And then when he moves now, and, and I'm trying to move really quickly, right? Yeah, yeah. When he moves throughout this, when he says the Lord revengeth and God takes vengeance on his enemies, and then it says uh in verse in verse number two. The Lord takes, he reserves wrath for his enemies. In other words, it's saying that during the times that you think God is allowing them to win, God is sitting back stacking a case against them. Yeah. It's like saying, I see what you're doing, and God just sometimes, he sits back and lets it build up and build up and build up to the extent where he says, now when I hit you with the punishment, now when I hit you with my vengeance, yeah, yeah. there is no excuse for you to speak against it because I have given you time and opportunity yeah, to relent. Yeah. And so it says that God reserves his wrath for his enemies. He's sitting back sometimes while you think God is not seeing, God is sitting back building up his case. And this is why Paul says, when you do good to those who do evil against you, yeah, yeah. you heap coals on their head because God is just sitting back and he, he will allow it to compound and yeah, compound yeah. and compound until he hits the enemies. And then he moves to say God, his ways, his way is like the whirlwind. His, uh, he is slow to anger Right, yeah, but yeah. great in power, it, it, he reserves the wrath. They go together. He reserves his wrath. He's slow to anger. He sits back sometimes to see how far they will go of crossing yeah. you. How far they will go with manipulating and taking advantage of you. How far they will go. He was. He is slow to anger, but great in power. Yeah. And then he does something when he's talking. Now we only we haven't even got to his whole message, but I like taking out time to get you to see how God operates in the world. His way is in is like the world when the Lord had his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. Now get this. If God is slow to anger yeah. and he reserves wrath for his enemies, then he comes back and say his way is in the whirlwind. It's getting you to understand how God works. That yeah. sometimes you don't see when the whirlwind is happening until it happens. Yeah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And sometimes God works just like that when he takes revenge on your enemies. He'll let them, he'll make it, let them think that they're winning. He'll let them think that they're going to overpower you. He'll yeah, let them yeah, think yeah. that they're taking advantage of you. He'll let them think that they're winning. And just like the whirlwind comes down all of a sudden and destroys whatever yeah, it is, yeah. this is how your God works. That sometimes you don't see God working until God is is working. He's been working the entire time yeah. and he's about to hit you and this is why I encourage especially my church people if you've been doing right, keep doing right because you have a God that will fight for you and when God strikes against your enemies and this is why you got to let God handle it. You got to let vengeance be God's and not yours. His way is in the whirlwind. Like he moves like a whirlwind moves. You don't see it. You don't hear it until it hits. And when it hits, it destroys whatever it hits. And this is how your God works. He works like the elements and in the storm. The storm, you can prepare for a storm. You can put all the reserves you want for a storm. But if the storm rages hard enough, it will destroy it no matter how fortified you think you are. And sometimes God works like that. Just like the rain this morning. Y'all caught the rain this morning. Yeah, but yeah. the rain was so strong. It was destroying mm -hmm. billboards. It was destroying signs. It was just rain and wind. And God yeah, has yeah. a way of working. And I believe it was a way of showing you that God moves like the elements move. You can prepare for them, but you can't stop it. Hear what I'm saying when I say this to you. The most thing that we have to learn about our God is that God does not move like we move, but when he moves, he is unstoppable. When God plans his plan of attack, you can't stop it. All you can do is track it, but you can't stop it. If you look, at, if you look at the storms in the sky, we can track the storms, but we can't stop the storms. Wherever the, God wants to send the rain, that's where it rains. Wherever the whirlwind comes down, that's where it comes down. Yeah, and yeah. who controls that? Nobody but God. And this is the same way that God works 
in your life. And this is why I want to encourage my church people, encourage my Christian brothers and sisters, yeah, yeah. because you don't always see when God is about to attack. You don't always see what God is about to do until it's done. And sometimes you put yourself on the wrong side by taking vengeance in your hands, and then you end up getting hit with the whirlwind that was reserved for your enemies. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so I want you to understand that. He says that the Lord is like the whirlwind. The Lord is like the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. And sometimes it's just like that when, when that did, uh, I, I noticed um, when, there, when there is a strong rain, you can look up above the ground and it looks like a cloud is just a mist. And yeah, sometimes yeah. when God strikes the thing or when God strikes it, it leaves a cloud of dust. It's just a way of saying that God has a way of completely obliterating it from, from yeah, something yeah. standing it to be in destruction to just be in dust and particles in the air. That when God hits it, God will destroy it. And this is why I got I want to remind you to trust God to handle it. Yeah, yeah. And then I like when he says this that God will not acquit the wicked. God will not acquit the wicked. Because sometimes it seems like your enemies are winning. Sometimes it seems like your enemies have the upper hand. Assyria was a big, strong, and powerful army. And this is Nahum saying, Children of Israel, I want you to know it seems like they're going to win this, but you take heart in your God. You yeah, trust yeah. in your God. Why does Nahum start off with the personality? and power of God. Why? Because he wants them to understand verse 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. Yeah. A stronghold in the day of trouble. He go. I believe, this is my belief, he goes into the personality of God, yeah, yeah. telling you God's characteristics. He will defend his people. He will take vengeance on his people. Then it shows you the power that he has, right? He destroyed, like the whirlwind and, yeah, and the yeah. storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. It shows you the power that God has. Yeah. Why does he go to great lengths to show you God's personality and God's power? Because I want you to get this. Assyria was a big, giant army. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes when you see things that are bigger than you, you lose heart. Sometimes when you see things that seem to be more powerful than you, it'll make you doubt and question God. Yeah, yeah. But Nahum opens the book by saying his personality is such that he is a protector and, and his power is such that he can he has the power to do whatever he wants to do. Yeah. He controls things that men don't control. And I believe he does that to teach you that you can trust in your God. That he presents the personality and the power of God to get them to understand that you can trust God when you are in trouble. This is what he says in verse A stronghold in the day of trouble. Let me say this to you in, as an encouragement. Yeah. You can trust God when you are in trouble right. because God's personality, who he is, will not let his people, he knoweth those who trust in him. Yeah. In other words, he sees you when you believe in him and, and it don't seem like it. He sees you when you put your trust in him and yeah. nobody else yeah. can see it. He knows who put they who have put their trust in him and for those who put their trust in him, it's him giving you the reassurance that you can trust God when you, in, when you are in trouble. Yeah. And this yeah. is for those who have issues that, that, are, that seem bigger than you, that giants that are larger than you, mountains that are too high for you. Uh, this is for those of us who have problems, who have issues. Yeah, and this yeah. is why I love it. We don't go no further in, in this first chapter. The first thing that Nahum wants the nation of Israel to understand is that you can trust God in trouble. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. does not acquit the wicked. He will not let the evil go unpunished. And I want you to understand that. He reveals God to be patient, but at the same time, he reveals him to be powerful and just. All wickedness will be held accountable. Even though it seems this is what this is what they, they used to say. You might get you may think you're getting by, but you are not getting away. And I want you to get this: that God sees all and He knows all, and He has a way. And, it, and it's His way of saying you can trust. God in trouble. You can trust God in the trouble. He has his ways of going about doing things. Yes, and then 
What he does is, what well, we read verse number 11 when the king comes out. And if you go to 2 Kings chapter number 18 and you'll see the king Sennacherib. I think that's how you say his name. He speaks against the, 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 the God of heaven. Yeah, and yeah. what we didn't read, who can stand against the, uh, the who God? Who can stand? And what makes you think that you can stand against God? And sometimes God can bless you so much. Yeah, and God yeah. can lift you up so much that you get caught up in yourself. Right. And yeah. then and then you start to think that it's you and God is saying, now, now, now for this king that's speaking all his indignations against me, I'm going to show him. And here's another thing that I want you, that I want to point out. Therefore, uh, thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet and likewise many, yet thus they shall be cut down. In other words, it's saying, though it looks like they are bigger than me, yeah. though it looks like they are bigger than you, though it looks like you can see them, but you can't see me, they shall be cut down. Even though I have hit you because I want you to get this, that the nation of Israel had gone, been going through it with God. And God said, even though I had to punish you, I will not punish you anymore. I will break his yoke from off the In other words, they had to uh, uh, they had to pay tribute. To the nation of Assyria. And God is saying the tribute that you had to pay. I'm going to break it off. The, the hold that they have on you. I'm going to destroy it. And sometimes God has to show you how much power he has. By allowing the people who thought they had control over you. To break the power over them. And this is what he's saying. He's saying Israel. I am going to break the power of the Assyrians over you. Yeah. Just so you know and they know. That I am the Lord your God. And how many of you know. Sometimes God has a way of showing his power in the faith. And this is what I love about God. I love that God, he don't wait until yeah, yeah. the nation of Assyria got low. He don't wait until they ran out of power. He don't wait until their enemies were small. He didn't wait until their enemies got beat up. He said it while they had the power. And he said, I'm saying this while they strong. I'm yeah. saying this while they powerful. I'm saying this while they big, bad, and bold. So that you will know when the time comes that they get low, you yeah. know who did it? And that's, that, that's so ironic. That, and this is what I love about God, how he's able to speak those things. And it looks one way while you're looking at it. That's but it. he says it while it looks that way. So that when it comes to what he said it would be, you will know that it was nobody but God. God. He'll right. tell you you're going to get victory when it looks like you're in an unwinnable situation. So that when you get victory, you will know that it yeah, was God. Yeah, yeah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He'll tell you you're going to get well while you sit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just so when you get well, you know that it was God. And so if there, if there was anything I would leave with you, you can trust God in the trouble. Come on, let's give God a hand praise. Now I want you to understand this. These minor prophets, they take a lot of history so that you can understand what's going on. All right. And so I know I took a lot of uh, time to explain, but I really want you to understand the Bible that you read, the stories that you read, and the significance of the minor prophets who are in the book. So, guys, thank y'all for watching. Thank y'all for coming. Come on, give yourself one more hand. Amen, amen, amen. All right, and so with that, guys, thank y'all for watching. I will see y'all next week. If you want to commit your life to Christ, um, all you have to do, you can say right where you are. You can say, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. And I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. And just like that, you will be saved. And if you are looking for a church home to continue your spiritual walk with God, our church is here and available for you. You can partner with us. You can connect yourself with our church by going to our website, tgmchurch.org. And there is a place there for you to submit your name. You can submit your email and your phone number. And we will contact you and connect you with our church. Uh, we post something on YouTube and um, on all of the podcast platforms every Wednesday and every, well, every Wednesday for the podcast platforms, but on our YouTube channel, we post Wednesdays and Sundays just to help you in your walk with God. So I want to say thank you for the class that came today. Thank you for watching. I will see you guys next week. Thank you so much for watching, or if you're listening, I want to say thank you as well. Never miss a Bible study or a sermon when you subscribe. And if you're on YouTube, tap the bell so you never miss when I post.